Hi everyone, I'm Saleha and this is Chai Chat and Community. We are recording this episode because Omer, who lives in the Middle East, has come to Melbourne for a short while. And while uh, he is in Melbourne, I am traveling. So the only way we could have met up and had this very important chat is by recording. So um, before we start talking um, about uh, international students, so that's what we are going to talk about today, what to expect, what to do before you take that flight from your country of birth to come to Australia, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting tonight. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today we are chatting about international students, what to expect when you land in Australia, acclimatization and integration, what to expect realistically and what not to, acceptance and everything else in between. Meet my guest, Omer Murtaza, who I met at a community social media group and who had one of the best posts about expectations of international student, students versus reality and what to expect in Australia. I was so blown away and it's taken us, like I said, six months to connect and have this conversation. Omer, thank you for joining me and, and we do meet ultimately. Ultimately, indeed. Uh, hi, Salia. Thank you so much for having me over. And my pleasure uh, to be joining you at this chat. Uh, just so as to let everyone know who will be hearing this webcast and podcast. I'm very privileged that over the past six and a half, seven years, my work has allowed me working very closely, interacting very closely from students around the world, both in Australia and overseas. And that has, you know, provided some unparalleled insights and some two cents to offer. I'll be very happy to share that with your audience. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Before we start talking about international students, let's talk about you. Other than the fact that you've been privileged, tell us something about your background, where you came from, when you came, what you're doing currently, everything that you would like to share with us. Well, thanks a lot, Salia. So where do we start? Yeah. So let me from start the beginning. My oh, from the beginning, right. <laughs> let me start my own journey as a student. So born and raised in Pakistan, uh, over there, I completed my chartered accountancy. I was interestingly, you know, we live in very interesting times. There was back when I finished my education, my professional education as a chartered accountant in 2008, I had an international secondment lined up with of all the places with PwC New Zealand. And wow. financial crisis back in 2008, it just couldn't happen. They stopped taking yep. international secondaries around that time. And that did leave me a little sad. And because, you know, I had pretty much all paperwork pretty much done. My passport was almost about to be submitted to the embassy when I actually said that there is an international secondary, you know, pause put on. But, you know, world works in mysterious ways little did i know that another opportunity came about from the middle east it was meant to be six months it ended up being nine years <laughs> so, wow. time showed me, so time surely flew during that time and during those nine years there was this appreciation of actually wanting to you know do something for myself who was single at that time but also you know uh, when i got married uh, you know uh, also, you know, where do we want to anchor ourselves and where do we want to base ourselves in the long term? And, uh, you know, the opportunity to apply to Australia uh, came about and, you know, we went through the entire process. And in 2018, we landed over here on these lovely shores. And Australia has been home since then. And, uh, yeah, if I reflect on the journey coming over here, the lockdowns in Melbourne stand as a highlight. <laughs> so, you know, I came to the most livable city in the world. It ended up being the most locked down city for two years in the world. So yes, my wife right. and I just had a running joke with each other that perhaps, you know, this is our luck coming into the country. Exactly. We've kind of bumped off Melbourne from the number one list, but it's been nothing short of being absolutely wonderful. And something I mentioned right up front of my work, working uh, closely with an affiliate of the Department of Education and Training uh, within Victoria and also some of the mentoring and the volunteering work I do. 
uh, you know, the past six years have provided, apart from work, a fantastic opportunity of getting to work with young people, like really, really young people. I'm talking primary school kids to a lot of university going and recent graduates as well. So, yeah, very grateful for this opportunity. This is not what I had access to while working in the Middle East in a corporate and uh, whereby my roles over here were very corporate focused in the morning, but in the evenings in Melbourne, they also allowed an opportunity to interact more with this community, something which I really, really cherish. More recently, Salia, something you mentioned, I have took upon an opportunity in the region and currently I'm back and forth between two places, two continents at the time. So that's I'm traveling bit- worldwide. I'm yeah, traveling I'm traveling worldwide, worldwide <laughs> just, just because of my nature of work or sometimes due to personal commitments and whatnot. So yeah, very happy to be back in Melbourne. I'm coming from the winters, so coming back into the Melbourne sun is welcome. But it was a bit too hot yesterday. <laughs> yep. Otherwise, and it is going to be, I think, back to Melbourne. At least, you know, you know, with Melbourne, you can never be disappointed. It throws surprises every day. Oh, 100%. indeed. And uh, so, yeah, lovely to be back home and lovely to have this chat with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Honestly, it's a pleasure. Okay. Now, let's talk about international students. We know that, uh, you know, for many people, this is the first time they're traveling overseas and they don't know what to expect. So what are the five top things you can think are important for newly arrived students? What should they do? when they get their, uh, let's say, the letter from the university, what are the Hmm. first things, you know? Hmm. Actually, you know, I think this is a very, very, uh, you know, it's a very hot question for the lack of a better word. I see this in community postscripts, uh, people asking things which ideally they should reflect upon before sitting on that plane, taking them halfway around the world in most of the circumstances. Salia, what comes to my mind is perhaps not exactly five things, but something which is kind of more fundamental is that just start speaking to people who've done this before. Often what happens is people just put up a random list of questions. Could you please pick me up from the airport? Could somebody just help me find accommodation? Or, you know, could I find some work? Could I find some, uh, or how does this happen? How does that happen? Rather than having an open-ended questions, which you don't even know whether or not they're complete, there must be, surely there must be somebody within their contact circle, within the family, within the wider social network who've been there, done that. What I have found often, people do not learn from the benefit of others' experience. So the first uh, thing which comes to my mind is, please reach out to people who've done this, and rather than asking, hey, can you do A or B for me, saying, hey, I'm a new student, secured my international student visas, expected to come up, could you please list down the top 10 things I need to know? People are very happy usually to share from their own experience. Ask something which enriches you and allows people an opportunity to share their experience. That is much more worthwhile. So I think it's the frame of mind which kind of needs to be shifted rather than one, two, three, ask, how can I learn from you? That would in itself allow people to share and divulge more. Then, Saleh, the next thing which comes to my mind is, I think it's really important for whether you're flying from, you know, somewhere in South Asia, the East Asia, South America, uh, these are a lot of places where our international students come from. Try to visualize your first week, fortnight, month, what would that look like? You'll be out of your comfort zone. You'll be doing quite a few things for the very first time. You'll be exposed to situations you may not have done that before because somebody in the family, friend circle would have kind of helped you out for those. So try to, you know, get those aspects sorted by just thinking about it, that I'm getting out of my comfort zone. Things will be a little bumpy. I need to accomplish a series of steps over a period of time. The quicker you make this transition, the easier it is when it actually happens. I've seen too often 
people are, you know, thinking, oh, I've been here for three weeks, four weeks. And I'm talking about this from reading on community groups. I'm very blue. I'm very lonely. I'm missing home. Probably because you did not have an agenda of things to do or check off in your mind. And because you're a bit, little bit bewildered, a little bit lost, you just kind of want to, you have this yearning and craving to go back to your comfort zone, which is kind of not there. And then that leads to that feeling of being lost. So I'll just very quickly recap, uh, speak to those who've done this before, engage with them, have a visualization of what your first week, fortnight, month would look like. And the last thing, which in this aspect I could mention is, you will come across people who are willing to help, who would be happy to help. Please the appreciate time. their time. Please appreciate that they have their own busy schedules. So where you may have previously taken things for granted due to culture, norms, or the comfort of being in the home country, things work very differently over here. So the quicker you learn to appreciate that, the quicker you tend to respect that, respect comes in both ways. It will not only Absolutely. set you up for success, it will also earn you the respect of those people who are helping you. And I think, you know, we people, we from South Asia, we forget two simple words that you should always say. One is please and one is thank you. Because well, they so. are not in our vocabulary. Absolutely not. And, uh, you know, it is like we just take people for granted. I read about um, somebody asking for assistance, you know, getting whether it is a pickup at the airport or getting them a job. And, mm. you know, they never rock up, you know. So somebody is waiting at the airport, taking out time from the busy schedule. And we are busy because we don't have help here, do we? I mean, we have to do everything ourselves. So if I have to go to the airport at 8 o'clock, which means I would have taken time off work to go and pick you up. And if you don't show up, and same with a job, if I offer you a job, and you don't rock up to a job, it is my reputation at stake. 100% so. completely agree with that. I think this comes with, this is not only something you need to do in Australia. I think this is everywhere. Life principles across the world, everywhere. You need to be disciplined. What happens is when you're making that transition from being a student who's usually living with mom and dad to being exposed yeah. in the wider world, you just need to pick up and take more responsibility. And with that, the quicker you do that, the quicker you earn respect of others as well. So thanks, Salia, for pointing that out. Another thing, um, Omar, that I read a lot is, hmm. you know, I don't have friends and I'm feeling lonely. I remember when we first came, I didn't know anybody for six months. For six months. It takes time to get a job also. And once you're at work, you know, you make friends with your colleagues. And then, of course, you know, being in the community, you then make friends with like-minded people. But mm -hmm. you really don't make friends tomorrow if you land up today. You don't. It takes time, you know. And uh, I think this loneliness can be killing, to be honest. I had my family with me. But while my girls made friends, like, in less than two days, it took me six months to find, uh, with the accent intact, you know, for, for yeah. me to find friends, it took six months. And it was tough. It is tough. But, you know, uh, I don't know. We never talk about mental health in our community, which is a big issue. Loneliness, mental health. And I think people should acknowledge that, too, when they're taking the flight to come to Australia, that there will be times when you will be lonely because people are busy. And, you know, you will miss your Amma and Abba and Ma and Papa and, you know, your sisters and brothers, your siblings, your relatives. But you just have to, you just have to, I suppose, bear up and, you know, have a positive outlook to life. I'm not saying it's easy, but we all learn and grow, don't we? I'm sure you face the same thing. Like you came, you had lockdown. We had 272 days of lockdown in Melbourne. How tough that was, was that? That was indeed very, very tough, very isolating. The lockdown coincided, not exactly when we came about, but you know, a year out from when we came and relocated over here. And despite having you know uh, good friends to call out and all, uh, we were just locked up. We were just locked up completely, you know, in our uh, in our dwelling places, and it was very isolating. It 
did get difficult. But then I think this is where you really need to fall back on being very resilient uh, in terms of persevering through tough times. Uh, your connection with your family and friends does not necessarily need to be having physical proximity to them. So, you know, technology was of assistance for sure. So, you know, apart from using a lot of net, apart from binging a lot of Netflix during those lockdowns. Yes, make, I think all we, of us did. Yeah. All of us did, right? We pushed the Netflix share price to sky. Uh, what was, what many of us were doing and rightly so was also connecting with friends and family, both locally and overseas using technology. Just keeping that connection part alive. And, you know, you mentioned at the start uh, about, you know, what things students uh, or international migrants need to keep in mind. Uh, one thing which I mentioned was uh, that they need to be very much focused and resilient and visualize what the first uh, week, fortnight, month looks like. But at the same time, you always need to maintain and keep the communication lines open with your loved ones because Absolutely. they are the source of strength and support for yourself. So that really needs to happen. And if you get that balance right, you know that you are supported, you know, at least in thought and prayers, and you're focused on the task on hand, you know, these are good ingredients to set you up for success. Absolutely. I agree. So um, here, here is something that uh, I think you and I have talked about. How, how realistic is it to expect a job within a week of landing in Australia? Within a week? It took me... Yeah, people have talked. Yes, okay. oh, wow. it took me six months because I was either overqualified or underqualified, and then I sat from the bottom and rose up. So, you know, so yeah, you know, sorry to burst the bubble uh, for those who may not like this response, but it's absolutely unrealistic. And I'm not saying that is uh, indictment on your skill level or or uh, you know uh, qualifications for those who are more mature or skill level for those who are more younger. I think it's just a wrong priority to have within the first week. I know there will be some of the target audience would be like, oh, it's financially and, you know, it has to happen. We need to contribute to our fees, but just hear me out. If your focus is immediately to start working, you have many key priorities off balance. And what are those key priorities? You really need to know where to settle. Part of it syncs up to the very first question you asked about, about preparing to come over here. So you first need to set yourself in terms of where are you going to live? Where is your education institution, particularly if you're a student? Where is university? Where is my college? Where am I going to live? How am I going to commute? Very important reasons, but less talked about. So if yeah. your initial priority is that, you know, can I get work in the first week? All what you'll be chasing is where is work available? Your commute, yeah. your dwelling place, everything else goes, you know, it goes like in the background, which is not at all the right frame of mind. After all, if you're a student, you came here to be educated, right? That's your number one priority. So, and opportunities are abound everywhere, irrespective of, you know, where your university is, work will come by, but you just need to have the right lens. People who are still not convinced, let me share something very practical. The first thing you'll need in any work, casual, semi-casual or professional is ID. So you have to get your ID, get your learner's driving license, ASAP, you come. So for the first week or two, get your basics set up properly. Make sure you have decent accommodation, know what your commuting ways, have kind of you know, got a good hang of how public transport actually works, get your ID. And then when you're comfortable with the university, your dwelling place, you're moving around, open your mind in terms of exploring working opportunities. And we will talk about working opportunities uh, later in the conversation, as I understand. But that's the right frame of mind to have. If you chase work, work, work before coming, while you're coming, and as soon as you land, you'll just be chasing work and everything else in life will just always, you know, be at the background and it will come back to haunt you. I've heard stories of people who found work in the first 10 days, uh, you know, in a warehouse, uh, in a facilities management situation, but then commuting back to the universities, one and a half hours journey one way, or they come yeah. up 
sleeping into their morning class at college. The, is it really worthwhile over a long period of time? Perhaps no. So, you know, and that doesn't to... lead to any PR, I think. I mean, you know, most, uh -huh. let's say most international students come here, no matter yeah. from where they are coming, you know, the, the end goal is a PR. And if you, if you're not studying hard enough to get those grades and do courses, which are actually in the skills list and the skills list keeps changing every, every, every second day. And something Omer, um, that I have learned because we don't have it in our countries of birth, as I keep saying is volunteering. I never oh. got a job. You know, when I came here, I was very, very senior working with a USAID project, um, looking after South Asia. When I came here, I was like, no, nah, it, it, we don't care. You're overqualified or you're underqualified. So I volunteered. I volunteered with the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence because I write for a living, as you know. So I just did, you know, magazines and newsletters and any kind of writing work they gave me, I did it. And that helped because volunteering is something that we do not understand because we don't have it in our psyche. But I know every university, if you're an international student, every university gives you gives you opportunities for volunteering. And that is fantastic because that is also a foot in the door. And um, uh, very true. No. I could not agree more uh, to volunteering and the benefit volunteering uh, brings. It's, it's amazing. I volunteer. This is my volunteer work. You know, my yeah. chai chat community, um, <laughs> which started during the pandemic, during lockdown, because you know, we couldn't go to work. What do we do? So I and I was hearing all kinds of stuff. International students were going through lots of issues. Migration was stopped. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, volunteering is, is a great way to give back to the community. Uh, you know, also a foot in the door because you then learn the Australian way of working. You know, in workplace culture is so important. It's so important. 100%. Um, completely agree with that. You know, I, w I was interviewing... Um, a managing director of IT from uh, KPMG a few years ago as part of my as part of my paid work. And he said something very interesting to me, Omer, and which I say to everybody who wants to know where to get a job. He said, I want to know when I'm interviewing somebody whether they have done a customer service, customer facing job, because we can train them at work. But I need to know how they are going to deal with customers because everybody is a customer you know everybody i mean our audience are our customers aren't they because they are listening to us and and learning something from it and i think this is something we we never understand so i always tell migrants get a foot in the door go work in customer service you know in the telcos and the banks and trust me that will be the first job that you get in australia and that will be the best learning that you will ever get yeah, I know we have this thing about call centers, but I tell you that is the best thing, best place to work and volunteering. Yeah, that's great advice. And uh, yeah, I'm not surprised at all that it's coming from, uh, you know, a leader in Big Four. Uh, you know, just building on that, actually, you've touched upon something which I had in mind, uh, you know, to share as we progress through the conversation, but I'll just call it out now people often, we talk about, is it realistic to get a job? Uh, I've I've shared my thoughts on that. But then you've talked about and your brilliant suggestion of finding customer service work, because that really gets you interacting with a wide spectrum of people. You know, Salia, I can mention for some of the best and the brightest minds I work with in my corporate roles in Australia, like, you know, corporate roles, but which were community focused, uh, some of the best people I've worked were people who worked in hospitality. They served tables, they were kitchen helps, they were taking orders, they were sitting on cash tills. Best and the brightest minds. Their ability to handle pressure, their ability to make quick decision making on the spot was second to none. And then I tried to have, you know, it was actually very intriguing for me. And I ended up having conversations with quite a few of them. And they mentioned that they just worked in the local, you know, diner, you know, in their community. Some of them had worked in, you know, one of our fast food chains uh, and whatnot. And then, you know, they actually call out when there's a lot of pressure on you, 
there are shifts involved this discipline you have to get stuff done in a defined period of time deal with irate customers sort their issues out it just help them in uni next day not only it helped Absolutely. them in uni yep. day, as soon as they took their first formal job uh, formal in terms of you know the corporate job which for which they had studied in university they were already so bet, much better placed to take upon the challenges which come in dealing with a working place where everybody is a stakeholder so you know yeah yeah so hospitality any role in hospitality especially when you are you know a new a uni student it would pay dividends a lot you know so yeah i would just want to add on to what you mentioned uh you know there is opportunity abound around you you just need to look at the right place i started my work life in a hotel and i tell you that was the best learning it i grew up in no time as you said you know irate customer thinking on your feet how to handle people it was it was just my best place and and my be- one of the best things i did in my life and i've made lifelong friends so that also now we are old we were all young i was looking at photographs that my husband brought from uh, india yesterday and i'm like wow i was young and but you know it is fantastic it is it what it gives you the ability to handle pressure is second to none oh 100% completely agree okay. with that um i'm now going to talk about people who are already here you know in the, let's say international students so i know for a fact working in a university that uh, they have jobs within the universities where students can apply they also have internships so how do you sh- how what do you think and how should the students approach that how do you go about it because uh, that was one of the things you had written in the in the social media post which caught my eye because while everybody was talking warehousing and uber you know yeah. uber eats and whatever else and uh, you talked about opportunities at universities yeah uh, uh thanks sale this is something which is close to my heart and uh, close to uh, because and i'll tell you why there's a little background to uh, this and also the post which you would have read you know without calling out specific names because i don't want anybody's linkedin profile to be spammed <laughs> you know after this uh, podcast but a senior uh, you know professor in one of the renowned universities in australia he and i you know both of us actually volunteer there you go both of us actually volunteer in one of our professional associations and we get an opportunity to connect and bond over there he was mentioning his disappointment that how many of the students within his university do not take up opportunities both paid and unpaid available within the campus and how it is actually an irritant because he himself hails from south asia and mentioned that just find it mind boggling that how people are always drawn towards cash paying jobs and please do not get me wrong there is no i'm not uh casting an aspersion or making any judgment call on taking a role uh with an uber eats or you know security for any student i know they're cash paying jobs they're fine it's good to have amongst your mixed bag of roles to have as a student but shouldn't be the be all and end all there are a lot of opportunity available you know within the university both paid and unpaid and i do want to put emphasis on paid roles you know universities they do want hands for certain events which they put up i they, agree i agree yeah we have daily rates which are perhaps better than what you can get out in the market you know for people coming together and facilitating events a course uh event you know also building up to a particular uh yeah events come to my mind because i know universities do a lot of events but then there are more structured roles within universities as well within the library you know within the community center within you know the student counseling and mentoring section because you know not only do you need to be a qualified therapist you don't need to be a qualified therapist to be a source of support for students right the Absolutely. best bonding yeah. students sometimes gets is just by talking to other students 
So there are opportunities available, but then there are teaching assistant roles available as well. There are teaching assistant roles whereby you can supplement with what the professor teaches in class. Sometimes these can be paid. Sometimes these can be unpaid yeah. as well. So, and unpaid is good because that's the volunteering that we are talking about. Oh, 100%. And you know, the part is that it just opens up your mind to the potential opportunities. Like I know someone who actually worked in the university canteen and cafeteria and made decent money out of that venture. And because it was so convenient, they were living on campus. They had work in the canteen and it was just so much better in comparison to their, those friends who were seeking work specifically as, you know, uh, working in Uber, which, which made them travel to far off distances. So it's just about opening up your mind and looking at opportunity, yeah. which is more nearby. And one thing which I would just say, Salia, how to crack those jobs, how to get those jobs, apart from bulletin boards, Facebook groups, uh, LinkedIn groups, or WhatsApp groups, Telegram, whatsoever. Firstly, have a presence, have a presence of yourself in the university, specifically for international students. Why are they there in the first place? They're there because they want to be educated and rightly so. So please build a presence, attend your classes, make yourself a noteworthy presence in the class which you attend, whether that's online, whether that's an in-person class have a presence which would allow you to be noticed, not only by fellow students, but by your educators, your peers, yeah. the admin and the secretarial staff within the university itself, which in its strike conversations, get out of your comfort zone, talk to people, inquire about opportunity. And there you go. You know, you have kind of really cracked open the door. This should be supplemented by reading bulletin boards with students put up. You know, in our times, there used to be bulletin boards where things would be pinned onto the wall. Now everything's digital. There must yeah. be an electronic bulletin board, Facebook groups, etc. Try to get knowledge from over there. But don't only, uh, for the lack of a better word, don't only sit behind the screen to look for opportunity. You have to venture out in the real world, strike conversations with actual people, ask about opportunity and opportunity will come by. Yeah, last last one. I know you are you are ready to go back to family, daughter, wife, um, and I'm all ready to start repacking for my flight day after morning. So how realistic Umair, is it to expect permanent residency from a student visa? Because as I said earlier, most students who come here as international students at the end of the day, all they want is a permanent residency and a life in Australia. How realistic is it? Is PR a mm. given or um, it is like, you know, it's, I mean, for me, I think when you and I came, it was really, none of us came in as students. So it is easy for us to preach. You came in as a mm. skilled migrant. I came in as a skilled migrant. But I know reading from what we do on community groups that at the end of the day, everybody wants to make a life here. Right. Uh, Salia, uh, thanks for actually calling that out. It's very important for, you know, anyone who listens to that webcast podcast to not jump into the conclusions. What would these guys know? Right. They would, didn't come here as students and yeah. whatnot. Calling that out has actually really helped me frame a response. I do not want to even go back to when you and I came, which was few, quite a few years ago. I want to share very relevant, very practical examples from the last two years, not from 10, not from 15 or 20, the very last two years I have. So just in terms of coming to your initial questions that how realistic it is, it is realistic but you need to manage expectations, right? And how do you need to manage expectations is by being true to yourself. If you want a pathway towards permanent residency, that should be something which will come along the way rather than you just being totally subsumed by that. If you're here for a university program, your first and foremost opportunity should be excelling at that university program, excelling at education. If you're good enough, 
and complete your university program, the education which you're seeking, there will be a pathway towards employment from an employer. I understand, yeah. and please correct my understanding if it's dated. You do get a two-year work permit after yes. you finish your education over here. And, and lots people, of people do uh, get jobs, you know, from there, and that leads to permanent. Exactly. But you know, what I always read and worry about about international students, and I will here only talk about South Asians groups that yeah. I am part of, is that from day one they want to do a job. So what was the point of coming to Australia to study? Hundred percent. Totally okay. agree with that. And, and Asalia, you make such a valid point. Unfortunately, I've also seen, come across, dealt and interacted with students because of my volunteering work, whereby yep, yep. in four years, they've changed five programs because they were not on the selected occupation list. Yep, that absolutely. I can understand your motivation. I can understand the advice you got from a particular migration agent, but that's potentially the worst thing you could do to yourself. Now, imagine yep. I've seen people who've pivoted from becoming engineers to IT to applied health professionals, to people uh, who are now training to be, you know, getting some skills uh, as, you know, chefs. Where this looks very diversified, what ends up happening in that period of five to six years, you do not end up picking a single skill which you can really resonate Absolutely. with or develop as an area of expertise. You're just chasing a down the lane end goal without developing any specific expertise which is wanted by the market so please be true to yourself pursue the education for which you've come over here with excellence to the best of your ability be an employable person you it's very important to be an employable person salia you've built the chat very nicely whereby you need to volunteer you need to do paid and unpaid jobs available within the university, casual, you talked about customer service, I added hospitality, do all of that while you're a student. So by the time you graduate, you are already pretty much well set to be in, absorbed by the market. And if you do a good role, if you prove your value proposition at your employer, trust me, they offer pathways whereby they there is a potential pathway towards sponsoring you. It may not even necessarily come from the employer itself, it may come by a particular visa category. And I would just like to share an example of a brilliant, absolutely brilliant uh, student who came into my organization when I was working for state government, Victoria, uh, an, an affiliate of state government of Victoria. She came as an intern, an absolute top quality student from one of the leading universities, worked with us. As soon as we approached the 18 month threshold, she's like, my two years are finishing. I know. It's a government role. It does not offer a uh, sponsored visa. But you know what? She was so good at what she did. Few of us made phone calls where we could potentially approach somebody in regional Victoria who had their own firm, accounting practice. They needed accountants. She actually moved on to a, wow. uh, a decent city. I'm not trying to give too much away. You know, people will look no, her no, up. No, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I know what and, you're uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And she went up into a regional city in Victoria, whereby she had a job waiting for her. She's already secured her PR now because she's been there for an X period of time. You know, in region Victoria, there's an accelerated path, but the employer facilitated that. Why and how did it happen? Sitting in Melbourne, was she ever aware of this particular accounting firm needs and uh, needs people? No, yeah. You know, in region Victoria, she wouldn't. But because she was so good at what she did. Even though my employer did not have opportunity available, they helped they and facilitate sure, yeah. that because she, they knew she was very good at what she was doing. So they just called up their contacts where work was possible. One thing led to another and this happened. So this is one example of a Amazing. very young yes. student. I'm talking about somebody who graduated in the year uh, in the 2020s, you know, I'm trying not to give too much away, but this is so no, recent. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is yeah, yeah. This is so recent. So it, it does happen. happen. It does happen. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, I have another case of mature mature students who came here for masters, and you know, who finished, and they were always mentally prepared to actually go back. You know, very well settled. Uh, you know, they wanted to go back and just join in the consulting practice they had in a, as a family business overseas. And what happened was because the niche in which my friend pursued their masters was so much niche and in demand, and demand within Australia, yeah. 
you know, they were offered to move to a different city, requested by the employer to continue with them for a period of two years with wow. the outright assurance that, you know, before the two years are finishing, we'll do our best to secure those, you know, employment visas or move you into another business within our community because it was a niche business where this is possible. Fast forward to as of today, they both have permanent residencies. As Yay! Well. They have yes. as well. But both these examples are from 2020s. But both of these examples, one is a very young undergraduate student. Others are more mature, mid-30s, gradu postgraduate students. They, what I want to actually call out is they were very committed, very focused in excelling what they came here to do. And that is as a student. They wanted to sharpen the skills. And then once they did find work to excel and make an impression as a very valuable employee. Eventually, it led to a PR pathway. But they were very focused and committed with being a good employee, being a good student, excelling in their work and why they came here for. And, you know, the long term path to PR just happened to come along the way. Excellent. This is so good. This is so good. Um, thank you, Mayor, for joining us. I'm sure when you come back again, we will catch up and oh, maybe have, have more in interesting things and we'll meet in person. Have chai oh, yeah, in the city where I work and I'm sure you will be there too. Um, I hope things work out well for you while you're in Melbourne and I'm sure we'll oh, keep thank talking. You. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much, Salia. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so Take much. Care, okay, bye. Bye.